Hey, welcome back to the One Year Bible Journey, especially for beginners. I'm Pastor Kerry, and guess what? We are halfway there. After this week, 50% of our journey is behind us, and this time I'm right. I did the math, (laughs) so this is week 26. Welcome to week 26. What a journey this has been. What a rewarding, uh, wonderful experience this has been. I hope that you are getting as much from it as I am. Listen, I have an, a quick assignment for you this week. I would like you to post in the comments. I'd like you to pull back and look at the whole six-month journey, those of you that have come all six months with me, um, and tell me what are your top two or three really big takeaways? What did you learn so far about God's story, about his word, that you didn't know? And maybe there's many things, but just take a quick minute and and the shorter the post, the, the more I'll be able to interact with it probably or the less time it will take me to interact with it. But I'd love to just read, what is God doing in your life and what are you? how has it changed your orientation towards Scripture? So I'm excited that we're halfway there and uh, it's all downhill now, right? So you need to have some ice cream today and celebrate that you have stayed on the journey. Whatever pace you're taking, I'm proud of you. All right, so the the schedule of reading before us this week, is 2 Chronicles 17 to 31. And we're not going to finish 2 Chronicles this week, but we're going to be close within a handful of chapters. 2 Chronicles 17 to 31, Romans 3 to 7, Psalms 77 to 79. We'll talk about Romans tomorrow in the New Testament video. But uh, this week you have more reading about kings. And we're coming to the end of this pre-exile, before the exile story of the people of Israel, and especially the southern kingdom. Now, remember, the northern kingdom is called Israel now. The southern kingdom is called Judah. And this week's reading, we're primarily, in Chronicles, we're primarily tracking the kings of Judah. Now, it's not entirely that. We're going to hear about some kings in the north, but we're not going to have the record that First and Second Kings gave us in terms of all of the kings of the north. We're simply going to Uh, get traces of how the southern kings interacted with the northern kings. Sometimes they're at war. Sometimes they're trying to strike an alliance. Sometimes they're trading. Sometimes they're teaming up. It's a weird thing, actually. Um, So this week, we're going to continue tracking the kings of the southern kingdom. And uh, we're going to see, at the highest level, we're going to see the kings that lead well to follow God, to worship God, experience blessing, and the people experience the blessing of God, and the kings that uh, trust in their enemies or look for help from anybody but God or get out of line or lead the people to worship uh, pagan idols, paganism, and terrible practices, then they experience the curse. And it's it's kind of an on-off story. It's kind of sad. You're going to you're going to read a lot this week of a lot of different kings and their deeds. And in some ways, this is review. We have already read about these kings. But here's why it's good to go back through it. Um, number one, it doesn't hurt to review. Number two, the Chronicles view is sharing the covenant, the relationship with God view, the spiritual view. And so there's more detail that's sprinkled into these stories of these kings than we got in First Kings. So you can kind of blend the stories together a little bit. But anyway, uh, as we, I'm just going to go back to last week real quick and see where we left off. We left off with King Asa, and in the 36th year of his reign, the northern kingdom invaded, um, and he called on the king of Aran, Syria, for help, which was a bad mistake. A prophet came, Han and I predicted that there would be future wars because he trusted in men and not him, and not the Lord, trusted in himself and not the Lord. At the end of uh, at the end of that prophecy, Asa imprisons the prophet. Way to go, you know, to, the guy that the one guy that's telling you the truth. Throw him in jail. And in the 39th year, uh, Asa gets sick, doesn't even pray, and uh, he dies at the 41st year of his reign. So that's where we le- left off last week in chapter 16. So we're picking up today in Second Chronicles chapter 17. And I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the narrative and try to give you the high view. Remember, the highest view, we're tracing the lineage of the kings to Jesus. We're seeing that God keeps his covenant and his promise to Abraham and to David and really to the world um, 
because he all the way back, he's going to crush the head of the serpent. He keeps his promise even though men fail, even though his people fail, even though leaders are on and off, they up and down, go, you know, go bad, then they go good, then they go bad. Um, God is constant through it all. You know, one of the things that can give us hope in this reading is that we live in a world where leadership changes. In, in the Western world, in America, um, we presidential elections every four years and congressional and Senate elections and, and local elections, governors and mayors. And so we're in a constant turnover of leaders. And sometimes we see good leaders and sometimes we see bad leaders. And it can be discouraging. The political landscape can be discouraging. But what we're seeing in this narrative is, number one, man-made leadership will always fail. It's always insufficient. Number two, men cannot save themselves. Number three, God is transcending. He transcends. His purposes is tr- are transcendent above all the political spectrum. Man cannot thwart the purposes of God or the promises of God. He keeps his promises. His word is reliable. And so don't build your hopes into the stock market. Don't build your hopes into the election cycle. Don't build your hopes into any uh, human schemes or plans. Put your hopes in the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord because he will keep his promises to you. So in chapter 17, you'll open with the name Jehoshaphat or Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is a good king. He reigns after Asa and he immediately, it's a great chapter, he immediately sends God's word throughout the land with emissaries reading the word of God. And and all of a sudden, because the nation becomes uh, reunited under kind of the worship of God again with Jehoshaphat, the enemies are terrified. Now, part of that's because that's what God does. He confuses and confounds the enemies. But part of it is because whenever they, they know, they know that Israel is most dangerous when they are following God. No wonder the surrounding nations wanted to tempt them and draw them away from God into paganism. They knew that God would curse them. That goes all the way back to the story of the Exodus. We studied that uh, in the story of Balaam, how that uh, Balak wanted to, to pervert, wanted to defeat Israel, but when he couldn't defeat them because God had protected them, that Balaam taught him how to pervert them and how to seduce them. So uh, it, that's how Satan works. If he can't have us, which if we're saved, he can't have us, he will still try to corrupt us. So uh, Satan is ap- a- after he, Satan's up to his old schemes. He's trying to corrupt the people of the southern kingdom, Judah. He's trying to disrupt God's plan. But, but Jehoshaphat leads the kingdom back to follow God. Chapter 18. Now, this is a, an anomaly. Jehoshaphat seems to have a bit of a divided heart. There's some duplicity here. We're going to see that over three chapters in the story of Jehoshaphat. And it first shows up here in chapter 18 because he allows or he has his son marry the daughter of Ahab. Now, remember, Ahab was the most wicked king of the north. Um, I mean, he was terrible, terrible, terrible with a capital T and his wife Jezebel, wicked, wicked king and queen. So why would Jehoshaphat, who's following God, allow his son to marry Ahab's daughter? Probably for political expedience. He probably wanted to get into some agreement and work peace, and he's probably trying to hedge his bets and ensure himself. It's a bad decision because Ahab's daughter, the daughter of this corrupt family from the north, is going to now corrupt the southern kingdom. So at this same time, he joins with Ahab to fight, um, and they bring all the prophets together to seek direction. And all the prophets are like, yeah, we can beat them, we can get them. But Ahab says, I, or, or, or I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat says, is there another prophet? In other words, he knows these guys are false prophets. And Ahab says, yeah, there's another one, but he only prophesies bad against me. <laughs> well, no wonder because you're rebelling against God. This man's name is Micaiah. And um, so they go and get Micaiah and Ahab said, it's a great story. I'll, I'll shorten it, but Ahab basically says, "Are you? Do you have any good news for me? You're going to prophesy good towards me?" And he says, "I'll tell you what God says," and he kind of prophesies at first sarcastically, saying, "Sure, go up and fight. You're going to win, but you're also going to die." Um, and the false prophets had lying spirits, but Micaiah 
told the truth. Of course, Ahab is angry about it and arrests him. They end up going to battle anyway against the advice of God through Micaiah. Ahab, trying to save his life like he can outsmart God, he disguises himself, playing games. Jehoshaphat looks like the king, so they target him. the enemy targets Jehoshaphat, finds out he's the king of the southern kingdom, and they quickly leave him alone. And then a random soldier shoots a random arrow into the air, just like, I mean, can you imagine? And God guides that arrow right through Ahab's armor. He asks his uh, person driving his chariot to get him away, and Ahab literally just lays in his chariot and bleeds out and dies right there in the chariot. So you just can't outrun God. You can't outsmart God ever. You turn to chapter 19 and you find out that God's really displeased with Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat at this point. Um, Jehoshaphat continues to appoint judges and he teaches them to please the Lord. They desire to please the Lord. It's almost like Jehoshaphat has this political commitment to God, but then this personal duplicity. It's, it's the strangest thing. And, um, it's, it's ironic because in chapter 19, Jehoshaphat stands and says to the leaders, don't have an undivided heart. Have a, you know, follow God with your whole heart. Meanwhile, his own heart is divided. So that's a strange thing. And it shows the duplicity that's possible in all of us. Chapter 20 is, um, is at their, the kingdoms at war with their surrounding nations, Moab, Ammon, Edom. These are all the nations to the east of the Jordan River, north to south. And it all kind of converges down in the, uh, in the Negev desert. And the people fast and pray. And the Levites are sharing the word of God. And they say the battle is the Lord's. And so they all congregate. They're going to go out to battle. They tell the people, don't be afraid. And I love this story because they send the Levites out in front singing. They go into battle singing, worshiping. How cool is that? They send the singers first. And as they're going and singing and as they're approaching the enemies, God sends confusion to the enemies. This just shows what fa- how faith transcends all of your best human plans, all of your best strategizing, all of your best planning. Faith always wins. They put God first. They put the worship of God first. They're, they're going out, obviously not to fight, but totally trusting God. This is reminiscent of maybe when the children of Israel marched around the walls of Jericho, you know, or the, blew the trumpets of Gideon. So God sends an amazing victory because all the enemy armies are confused and they turn against each other and they literally destroy each other and all of them flee And so as the singing Levites with the ensuing armies get into the battle area and the camps of the enemies, it's all gone. Everyone's gone except for the stuff. And so they get much treasure and much spoil. And they have called that valley the Valley of Blessing. They return to Jerusalem with all the treasure. They bring the treasures to the temple. And Jehoshaphat's kingdom ends peaceably. It's also an indication and a reminder to us that your worst days don't have to define you spiritually or your legacy. Uh, Jehoshaphat reigned 25 years. Um, later, at the very end, he, he made a bad decision to ally with the uh, king of the north and to share in a fleet of trading ships. You're going to read about how God destroyed that, those. Chapter 21, you come into the reign of a man named Jehoram. Jehoram is Jehoshaphat's son. He reigns in Judah. It's a strange turn of events. Immediately, Jehoram kills all of his brothers. He's 32 when he begins to reign. He only reigns eight years, and he also marries Ahab's daughters. Now, you've got two daughters of Ahab that have been married into the southern kingdom, and Jehoram is immediately a wicked king. But you're going to read in this chapter, the Lord kept his covenant with David. You're going to read about battles. You're going to read how he led Judah into paganism and was cursed for it. Uh, God struck him with disease. Uh, Egypt's army invaded and carried away his family. Interestingly enough, his youngest son was spared. We already read about this, but this is God's providence preserving that that kingly line. Twice in this week's reading, you're going to read it's down to one person, one child, one descendant. Satan uh, wanted to win, wanted so bad to defeat that line. Um, But this youngest son is spared. The nurse spares him. And um, I'm trying to read here. Okay, Jehoram dies. No one's sad when he dies. I think I'm a little ahead of myself. 
uh, on on how he how the youngest was spared. Chapter twenty two, Ahaziah. Ahaziah is now going to become king at twenty two. So that's the youngest son. That's that's the first account I was thinking of. I'm I'm sorry. This is not the child that's spared. This is the youngest son, Ahaziah, that's spared. So he becomes king at twenty two. His mother. Athaliah was a wicked woman. We studied her already too, but Ahaziah does a lot of evil, follows kind of in the steps of Jehoram. And he joined with the king of the north, Joram, Ahab's son. And so now the corruption of the north has really come into the south through Ahab's two daughters and through this a league now with Joram, who was uh, uh, Ahab's son. So in chapter 22, you're going to read about This King Jehu from the south, who ends up becoming king in the north, who killed Ahaziah when he was visiting in the north. So Jehu was that man who drove his chariot furiously and he avenges the name of God, really. He's not a spiritual man, but he's a raucous disruptor. Um, And he, he becomes a ruler in the north after Joram because he wipes out all of Ahab's legacy and all of the pagan, all of the Baal worship. Uh, he just is a total disruptor to Satan's program in the north. Well, he also kills the king of the south, Ahaziah. And when Athaliah finds out that her son was killed, she kills all of his kids. It's the craziest thing. This grandma goes on this rampage. And when the nurse realizes that all the children are being killed, she hides Joash, the youngest who's a baby, he's one. And she takes him to the temple and she gives him to the high priest Jehoiada. And Jehoiada raises him for six years. So God twice now in these chapters preserves the kingly line. Very critical for the gospel linkage, for the story, okay? So you're gonna turn to chapter 23 and six years later read that Jehoiada the high priest brings the king, now seven, the heir, out of hiding at the temple and gathers all the leaders and and priests and there's a pact. They make a pact that they're going to revolt against Athaliah and anoint Joash to be the king. So as this plan becomes visible, Athaliah resists, tries to preserve her life. They seize her, they kill her outside the temple grounds. They demolish all of the Baal worship and they resume offerings to the Lord, and the nation returns to God. Yay, Jehoiada. Thank you, God, for Joash, for preserving the life of Joash. So chapter 24 is the reign of Joash, 40 years. Joash repairs the temple. He receives offerings from the people all over the southern kingdom, and there's major repair work, major renovations that you're going to read about. So you're going to read that Joash lives long and does a lot of good, but later, In his reign, his reforms were reversed, strangely, and he allowed paganism to return. But, and we're going to read this repeatedly, God sends prophets. He always sends his word. He always sends his messengers. God sends prophets, and a prophet named Zechariah spoke out against this reversal of these reforms. Interesting how Joash started good and ended badly. That the nation abandoned God, abandoned God after their renewal and their and their reform. Joash is angry and demands that Zechariah be killed. Uh, It's a terrible, treacherous, traitorous move where he turns against Zechariah. Zechariah is killed, you're going to read, in the courtyard of the temple, which was a, a defiling thing. It was directly against the laws of God. And because of this, because of this reversal in Joash's life, the enemies invade. And God allows Judah to be defeated, at least for a season, And in the end, his own officials assassinate him while he's sleeping. And so we read of the tragic end of Joash's reign. Why did he turn? Why did his heart shift? I don't know, but it shows again that one season is not another. And we can wreck our lives anywhere along the journey. And uh, it's important for us every day to be committed and devoted and to renew our surrender to the Lord and to be faithful all the way, to run the race with patience. So chapter 25, Joash's son, Amaziah, reigns. He's 25 years old. He reigns for 29 years. Mostly, he does good. He immediately avenges his father's death. 
He organized the army. He hires troops from the north, which he shouldn't have done. He was warned by a prophet about that. The Lord, he's told, is able to defend and provide for you. Don't depend on your own schemes. Don't depend on the armies of the north. So Amaziah wins. He, he doesn't listen. He wins. He wins the battle, finds great spoil, ends up bringing back the idols from the spoil, and has the prophet silenced. And Amaziah then goes about threatening the northern kingdom, but loses big time. The king of the north uh, comes down and captures Amaziah. Jerusalem is plundered. And, uh, and, and King Amaziah is essentially humiliated and allowed to live on for 15 more years. He fled to Lachish from some cons- conspirators who wanted to kill him, and they caught up with him. He was killed in Lachish, which is southwest of, of Jerusalem, and they brought him back and buried him in the city of David. And his son, chapter 26, Uzziah, reigns. He's 16 when he takes the throne. He reigns for 52 years. Uzziah has a good reign. He pleased the Lord. He does a lot of battling. He fights the Philistines and re- regains a lot of territory and cities and wins big against the Philistines. He grows very powerful and blessed and secure. And I'm just reminded all the way through the reading, everything kind of rises and falls in this nation on leadership. Good leaders are blessed and the people are blessed. Bad leaders are cursed and the people, the nation, the whole thing becomes cursed. Who is it that you have influence over? Who is it that you lead? May God help us to lead well and influence well. Later, Uzziah, you're going to read, he sins with pride, and he personally enters the temple to burn incense to God, which was not his role. It was not his authority to do so. He stepped over God's boundary and stepped out of his lane. He knew he did this. It was disrespectful to God. It was disrespectful to the priests and to the structure of God being the true king of Israel. And because of this, God gave Uzziah leprosy, and he had leprosy until he died which means he could no longer enter the temple grounds to worship. It means he could no longer live in proximity to people, frankly, and he had to live in isolation until he died. We'll come, we'll come back. Uzziah's name is going to come back around when we study some of the prophets. Isaiah talks about the year that King Uzziah died. Well, chapter 27, Jotham, uh, Uzziah's son, is 25 years old. He begins to reign. He reigns 16 years, and he did what was right. But the people continued to do corrupt things. Jotham was blessed. He was powerful. God gave him a good kingdom. Chapter 28, Ahaz, his son, follows him at age 28, reigns for 16 years. He does evil. You turn. Offers his own son in sacrifice to Molech. What a tragic turn of events. Uh, The king of Aram, Syria, And the king of Israel both defeated this man, Ahaz, in battle. Judah was defeated and plundered. Many people, as a result of these battles, were captured, exiled, enslaved. Um, When the people from the northern kingdom take their countrymen from the southern kingdom back to the north to enslave them, they are spoken out against by the prophet Obed in Samaria. God always has his people He places his people. And even though the northern kingdom was corrupt, Samaria was the capital city, by the way, God had his people and he had Obed, his prophet, in Samaria. And that prophet spoke out against the northern kingdom raiding and taking other Jewish people captive. He indicted them and he said, you're you're stirring up the anger of God, which is already stirred up. So as a result, they released the prisoners They clothe them, they care for them, they take them back to the southern kingdom, they let them go at Jericho, which is to the east, down out of the hills in the desert, um, outside of Jerusalem. Ahaz uh, then later asks Assyria, the king of Assyria, for help against the Philistines who had raided all the villages of the south. You know, it's ironic because they'd already defeated the Philistines. God bless them. You'd think they'd learn their lesson. One of the big things about this is, is, is they never really learn their lesson. The relentless fallen condition of the human heart. It just keeps going back, keeps going back. So um, the king of Assyria takes advantage of the opportunity and plunders Jerusalem, plunders the southern kingdom, takes advantage of their vulnerability. So uh, as a result, Ahaz rejected the Lord, worshiped false gods, shut the temple up and really provoked God. He actually prohibited the worship of God in Jerusalem. What a tragic, 
tale. Well, when you turn to chapter 29, this dark chapter is going to be over. The reign of Ahaz was terrible, but his son Hezekiah has a different heart. And for the next few chapters, we're going to be talking about Hezekiah because Hezekiah was one of the good guys. I like the reign of Hezekiah. God used the reign of Hezekiah really particularly in my life um, as I was transitioning to ministry in New England. Just the work that Hezekiah does is a revitalizing work. It's a restorative. It's a renewing and a reviving work. And I knew that God needed Emmanuel, wanted Emmanuel. I believed God wanted Emmanuel to experience a revitalization, a restoration. And so the, the ministry of Hezekiah really spoke profoundly to me. Hezekiah begins ruling at 25. He's a young leader. He reigns for 29 years. He does right. He opened the temple. He removed paganism. He repaired the doors and relit the lamps and revived worship. He purified and renewed all things and totally rededicated the temple. It's a great story. The people returned to God with their whole hearts and with free will and thanks offerings and everything. It says, I love chapter 29 because it says everything was accomplished very quickly. It was suddenly. And that's what God was doing in my life 12 years ago. It was all very sudden. Chapter 30 uh, Hezekiah reinstates the Passover. It's been a long time since Passover has been celebrated and all of Israel, the North and Judah are invited. And despite but a remnant coming uh, because of many of the invasions, the people come together and they celebrate Passover. And as they sent these messengers all throughout uh, Israel, North and South, and it's ironic because many of the people were still worshiping in paganism, so they're scorning and mocking and laughing at the messengers. But still, many returned to worship. And from the northern kingdom, there was this remnant. From the southern kingdom, they all returned. They all had one unified heart. And it's an interesting story because some had followed the laws of purification, but many gathered that day to reconstitute the Passover, and they hadn't followed the purification laws. And so they're a little bit perplexed as do they even allow these people to participate? Do they receive the offerings? And, and Hezekiah asks God uh, to receive the impure into the worship, and God permits. I love this because it's an expression of gospel mercy and grace. And it shows us that the people weren't made pure by the cleansing waters or by the rituals or by the laws. They were made pure really by faith in the mercy and the grace of God because the prayer and God's acceptance of the prayer made them pure. So it's really a, it's really a peak at New Testament um, terminology and New Testament sense of things, that, and that the heart of God really has never changed. So God receives the pure and the impure, and what a, a wow moment this is when Passover is, is reconstituted. All of the nation rejoices, the, the southern kingdom, great joy, the people are blessed. Judah's relationship with God in all of these generations has been transactional, up and down, on and off. And for this moment, again, it's almost like the kingdom of David. It's almost like real and genuine and authentic and pure and, and free will all over again. I just want to pause and insert here, my friend, that God does not want us to have a transactional relationship. You know, you scratch his back, he scratches yours. That's not what he's looking for. He wants your heart. He wants to give you a new heart. And he wants your relationship to be driven by love. All these on and off kings, it was just performance based. And it wasn't really reflective of a love relationship with God, except going back to David. And there may have been some, some pinholes of light along the way, but, but finally with, with Hezekiah, there's, there's this restored sense of things and it's good. Um, but so often they don't love him. They just want something from him. And I don't want that to be true of me. I mean, I, there's a lot that I need from God, but I, I want to love him for him, for who he is. Well, the last chapter of our reading this week is um, still the continued reforms of Hezekiah. It's the people of Israel or the people of Judah smashing uh, some of the idols from the north. Uh, actually, those I think that came south go back north and they, they get rid of their idols. They purify their lives, which is a good thing. And you're going to read the rest of the chapter. Hezekiah organizes the priests and reconstitutes the worship. Um, you're going to read an interesting thing about him requiring the keeping of the law in terms of the offerings, the tithe. But then you read the people responding willingly and generously, and they exceeded the tithe. 
In other words, they believed in grace giving. They gave abundantly above what was required. And they gave so much that the provision almost was too much. So the temple was completely supplied. The storerooms were prepared and the people continue to faithfully provide for the, <coughs> excuse me, they continue to provide faithfully for the work of God, for the worship of God, and for the mission that God had given them as a nation. And it's just awesome to read about the free will and the abundant heart of gratitude and worship that these people followed God with. Hezekiah's reign is summarized this way. He sought God with his whole heart and God blessed him. And next week, we're going to read the rest of the story of Hezekiah, and he's going to show up again in the book of Isaiah. But there's quite a turn of events um, and an amazing account of what happens next in the life of Hezekiah. So you're going to enjoy the reading as we pick it up next week. So that is chapters 17 to 31 of the book of Second Chronicles. God's keeping his promise. He keeps his covenant. Things go up and down with leadership, but God is constant and transcendent. And we truly follow him. And when things look bad, politically, circumstantially, situationally, economically, they don't have to be bad spiritually. That's one of the big takeaways. The gospel's right on track. God's plan is coming together. He's leading human history forward. And Jesus, the Messiah, will come right out of this line. And God will keep his promise to the whole world. Hey, share your thoughts, what you're learning, what God's doing in your life. I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks for taking the journey. Happy week 26. You're halfway there. We'll see you next time.